Welcome back to my channel. Today I would like to present to you a matter that was widely covered by the media in the United States and Canada in 2009. I invite you to listen to the story of Jasmine Fior. On August 15, 2009, around 7 a.m., in Buena Park, California, a man passing by a dumpster noticed a gray suitcase lying near one of the bins. He saw some liquid leaking from it, so he decided to check what was inside. He opened it slightly and saw something he definitely did not expect. Inside was a body, most likely of a child. The man immediately notified the police, and when officers arrived, they could only confirm the discovery of the body. However, the victim was not a child but a young woman, aged between 20 and 30 years old. She was naked and had no identification on her. Due to severe beating, her face was swollen, which made identification difficult. The killer had also taken steps to prevent the police from identifying her. He removed her fingertips and all of her teeth. Identifying the victim seemed impossible at first, and the police knew from the outset that it would be very challenging. Due to the condition of the body, investigators knew that she had recently lost her life. They checked if anyone had reported a young woman missing recently, but no reports had been filed for a person of her age, and no one was looking for her. When investigators feared they might never identify the young woman, a breakthrough came from a completely unexpected source. During the autopsy, one of the pathologists noticed that the victim had undergone breast augmentation surgery. He knew that each implant has a serial number recorded in the patient's file. It remained to determine the manufacturer, trace where the batch containing the specific implant number had been sent, and later at the clinic, identify which patient had received it. And that's how the investigators learned that the woman found in the suitcase was Jasmine Fior. But who was Jasmine Fior? Her real name was Jasmine Lepore. She was born in 1981 and came from Bonnie Dune, California. From a young age, she was very interested in sports and was a very active child. She was also a very kind and empathetic girl, always caring that everyone was happy and content. Despite her parents' divorce when she was eight years old, she remained a happy and cheerful child, raised solely by her mother. In addition to playing football and other sports, she loved horseback riding. She was fortunate that her friend was well off and owned horses, so Jasmine could ride whenever she wanted. As she grew older, Jasmine, who was a beautiful girl, began dreaming of a modeling career and all that it entailed, fame and wealth. After finishing high school, she moved to Las Vegas, knowing she had better chances of finding work in her dream profession. She quickly found a job as a model, posing for swimsuit catalogs and magazines. Later, she also became a body painting model, showcasing painted artworks on her body. She also worked in casinos as a hostess and promoted golf events for Playboy. Although she worked for Playboy, her photo never appeared in the magazine itself. She became more and more recognizable and started appearing on the red carpet alongside famous people. It was then that she decided to change her name and from that time on she was no longer Jasmine Lepore but Jasmine Fior. People often judged her by her looks and she constantly battled the dumb blonde stereotype. But in reality she wasn't just pretty. She was also intelligent. She didn't intend to stop at modeling. While modeling was satisfying, Jasmine had other plans for the future. As she continued to be passionate about sports, she wanted to become a personal trainer and open her own gym. She also had plans related to working in real estate. She had passed the exam and intended to become a real estate agent. Various men appeared in her personal life. Jasmine was a beautiful woman, so she didn't lack male attention. One of her partners was Robert Hasman, whom Jasmine considered the perfect partner, the man she wanted to grow old with. However, their relationship was rather turbulent. The couple broke up and got back together several times until they finally parted ways for good. Another relationship of Jasmine's even ended in engagement in 2006, but after some time, it turned out that this relationship had no future, and the couple decided to part ways while remaining friends. In March 2009, Jasmine met 32-year-old millionaire Ryan Jenkins in a casino. He came from a wealthy family and was a businessman investing in real estate. His net worth was estimated at $2.5 million. Ryan was from Canada but had come to the United States to participate in a television show. It was a reality show titled Megan Wants a Millionaire. In this program, a beautiful woman named Megan and several well-off men competed for her affections. 
At the end of the show, this woman had to choose one of her suitors. Despite not being one of the nicest candidates on the show, Ryan made it to the final three. Ultimately, he wasn't chosen by Megan, as it turned out later, solely because the production team didn't allow it. For Megan, he was candidate number one, but for the producers, his choice wasn't a good ending for the show. When Ryan met Jasmine, the show hadn't aired yet. For her, he was a completely unknown person. But the connection between them was so intense that after just 48 hours together, they decided to get married. It's not really known if it was love or pure calculation since this relationship was beneficial for both parties. Ryan, being from Canada, wanted to stay in the United States longer. An American wife would facilitate the green card process. Jasmine wouldn't lose out either by marrying Ryan, as he promised her that as his wife, she would receive $10,000 a month. In any case, the couple married in a chapel in Las Vegas after two days of knowing each other. At first they were very happy, but over time Ryan began to show his less interesting and less pleasant side more and more often. He was explosive, and increasingly there were arguments between him and Jasmine. Ryan was very unhappy with the fact that his wife kept in touch with her ex-partners. He was very jealous of her. Once he witnessed Jasmine kissing one of them during a poolside party. His reaction was immediate. He ran up to Jasmine and hit her in the shoulder with such force that she fell into the pool. The police were called, and in December 2009, Ryan was supposed to appear in court for this. However, this did not lead to the end of their relationship. They tried to resolve this crisis, but everything they did was temporary. Sooner or later, another argument would occur. The turning point for Jasmine came when she found her husband in their own bedroom with another woman. It wasn't accidental. Ryan did it intentionally, knowing at what time his wife would return home. He wanted her to feel what he felt for once, to be jealous of him as he was of her. But Jasmine had enough of this relationship, enough of the fights, jealousy scenes, and supporting her husband, because despite his promises of a life of luxury and monthly financial support, Jasmine never saw a cent of his money. She was the one supporting him all the time, and they lived in her apartment. She threatened Ryan with annulling their marriage, which he couldn't afford. He began to panic and think about how to fix the situation. He came up with the idea of participating in another reality show where the prize was $250,000. He got into the program, and recordings began in June, taking place in Mexico and lasting a whole month. There, Ryan had a huge problem with Jasmine being alone in the States. He constantly wondered what she was doing when he wasn't around, whether she was meeting with one of her ex-partners. After a month of recording, the program ended, and Ryan managed to win the show and collect the main prize. He immediately gave all the money to Jasmine, hoping to save their relationship this way. And for a while, their marriage did improve. Ryan posted photos online showing him together with his wife, appearing happy at that time. In the summer, the program Megan Wants a Millionaire began airing, and Ryan became a recognized figure in the crowd. Wherever they appeared together with Jasmine, they were immediately noticed. This situation didn't bother them at all. They had what both of them wanted. Recognition and fame. On August 13, 2009, Jasmine and Ryan went to San Diego, where they were invited as honorary guests to a poker tournament. They stayed at the Lawbridge Del Mar Hotel and on the same day went to the Hilton Hotel, where the tournament was held. They were there until 2.30 in the morning, seen leaving the hotel. Two days later, on August 15, Ryan started calling all his friends asking about Jasmine. The day before, around 8 p.m., she had gone out shopping into the manicurist, and that was the last trace of her. He had no contact with her. No one knew where the woman could be. Not seeing any other way out, Ryan reported Jasmine missing on the evening of August 15th. When two days after reporting her missing, the police contacted Ryan to come to the station for additional explanations, he stated it was impossible because he was on his way to Canada to deal with important financial and immigration matters. This attitude surprised the officers a bit, but Ryan explained that his wife had disappeared for a few days before so he wasn't convinced they needed to worry so much about it. Besides, when Jasmine had disappeared before for a few days, it was never reported anywhere. The next day, on August 18th, the police began to suspect what might be the reason for Jasmine's husband's behavior. That day, the woman found in the suitcase was identified, and it was already known that Jasmine Fiore had been murdered. The search for Ryan began, and with the help of monitoring, Investigators could determine that he left the house where he lived with Jasmine the day after reporting her missing, 
on August 16th at 9 a.m. He went to Las Vegas to pick up his boat. Police received information that he owned a boat and knew where it was, but when they arrived, it was too late. Ryan managed to pick it up and from there headed towards Canada, crossing the border on August 19th or 20. Because his trip to Canada coincided with his reported disappearance and the discovery of Jasmine's body, an arrest warrant was issued for him. It applied in Canada as well, and if he were arrested there, U.S. authorities could request extradition, but only if they assured Canadians that Ryan would not receive the death penalty. During the investigation, detectives interviewed Jasmine's acquaintances and obtained information about the trip that took place two days before the body was found. They learned which hotel the couple had stayed at and obtained surveillance footage from the location. The first images showing the couple arriving in a white Mercedes belonging to Jasmine at the hotel's entrance caught the investigator's attention. It was clear that a hotel staff member removed a gray suitcase from the car, exactly like the one in which Jasmine's body was found. The couple went to their room and left elegantly dressed about two hours later. They were probably heading to the Hilton Hotel, a 10-minute drive away by car, for a poker tournament they had been invited to. They left the hotel at 2.30 a.m., as recorded on the surveillance cameras, and were later seen at a nightclub. The next recording is from the hotel where they stayed. One of the cameras was located in the hallway near their room. However, at that time only Ryan appears in the recordings. Around 4.30 a.m., he is seen running down the hallway to his room. Half an hour later, he appears again, no longer wearing the suit he had on earlier, but instead wearing sweatpants and a sleeveless shirt. He puts something on the hallway shelf, then heads towards the reception. A moment later, he is seen returning to his room with a bucket of ice. Again on the recordings, he appears nearly one and a half hours later at 6.24 a.m., when he exits the room holding all his clothes and cosmetics. Investigators had to check the room where the couple stayed and were also curious about what Ryan hid on the shelf in the hotel hallway. They went to the Lawbridge Del Mar Hotel and quickly found an answer to one of their troubling questions, as an item Ryan left behind was still on the hallway shelf. It was a hotel phone headset. In the room where the couple stayed, no fingerprints or traces of blood were found, however, it should be noted that investigators checked the room several days after Ryan and Jasmine left, and the room had already been cleaned. Nonetheless, their visit to the hotel was not fruitless because investigators discovered that there was a second exit from the ground floor room. It led to a patio, separated from the parking lot by only a low wall. This second exit was likely the answer to how Ryan removed the suitcase from the room. Nothing found in the room helped investigators solve this puzzle but bloodstains and a long brown hair were found on the patio. They were sent for analysis, and both the blood and hair belonged to Jasmine. This information did not help investigators answer where the woman was murdered. Ryan Jenkins was still wanted, and a $25,000 reward was offered for help in finding him. Jasmine's family and her ex-partner Robert Hasman appeared on television begging for help in apprehending the perpetrator. Ryan was then the most wanted man in the United States and Canada until August 23rd, when investigators received information that he had been found at the Thunderbird Motel in Hope, in Canada. He had checked in three days earlier, on August 20th. He was accompanied by a young blonde woman, with whom he arrived at the motel not in his police-seized BMW, but in a car with Canadian license plates. Ryan remained in the car while his companion, a woman aged 25 to 30, handled all the formalities at the reception. She paid cash for a three-day stay and went to Ryan's room with him, leaving after about 20 minutes. During this stay, the owners only saw Ryan once when he left the room briefly and stood in front of the door for a short while. He looked exhausted and nothing like the man whose pictures were shown on television. Ryan was supposed to check out of the room by 11 a.m. on August 23rd, but he did not appear at the reception, so the motel owner went to ask if he wanted to stay longer. There was no response, so the man returned to his office to call the room where Ryan had been staying. Again, there was no answer so the owner and his nephew entered. There they found Ryan, but he was already dead. He took his own life. There was no farewell letter or note found on site. But later, police found a file dated August 20th on his computer titled Last Will and Testament. Ryan wrote about his love for Jasmine, how he sometimes felt jealous and angry, but it was because Jasmine gave him reasons to be jealous by maintaining contact with her ex-partners. He generally tried to portray Jasmine in a bad light, he also apologized to his family for causing problems. 
However, in the entire letter, he never mentioned his wife's death once and did not admit that he was responsible for the crime. Three days later, on August 26th, Jasmine's white Mercedes, which the couple had driven to the LaBerge Hotel, was found in the parking lot near a bank in West Hollywood, about one mile from Jasmine's apartment. Despite the car being washed on the outside and cleaned inside, many bloodstains were still found inside the vehicle. On the passenger seat, on the inner side of the door, on the carpet, and most on the rear seat of the car. Investigators suspected that this was where Ryan had placed the suitcase with his wife's body. Since Jasmine's phone records had already been checked, police knew that evening she had contacted one of her former partners, Robert Hasman, several times. It was the man Jasmine considered an ideal partner, and she had split up with him for some reason. Jasmine wrote to him in text messages asking to send her private airplane. She didn't feel comfortable and safe with Ryan. She just wanted to end her marriage and return to Robert. With all this information, investigators could suspect what Jasmine's last moments looked like and created the most likely version of events. Ryan presumably discovered in the car that Jasmine was messaging her ex-boyfriend, which led to an outburst of anger. There were traces in the car indicating that he veered off the main road, and when he found himself on a remote road, he started beating her so hard that he broke her nose. After everything, they went to the hotel where Ryan entered alone because he didn't want anyone to see Jasmine's condition. He quickly ran to the room to bring her in through the back door, hence the bloodstains and hair on the patio. Once they were in the room, he had to change because there could have been bloodstains on his suit. Jasmine was beaten but still conscious, so he took the phone from the room so she couldn't call anyone and went to the reception for ice, which he might need to reduce the swelling on Jasmine's face. Investigators suspected that at that moment Ryan might have been apologizing to his wife promising that it would not happen again, but Jasmine may not have wanted to repair the relationship again. She just wanted to end it. Ryan couldn't afford it, especially since his wife had many signs of abuse, including a broken nose. Jasmine had already reported to the police once that he was aggressive towards her, for which he was awaiting trial. Another report could only mean one thing, prison. Therefore, Ryan, seeing no way out, decided on the ultimate step. He had to get rid of his wife, and according to the autopsy, he did so by strangling her. Later, he put her body in a suitcase and again, using the rear exit, took the suitcase through the patio to the car. He deprived her of her fingertips and teeth and abandoned the suitcase near a trash can. This was the version of the detectives and we will never know what really happened. The only person who could say anything about it took his own life, taking this secret to the grave. Thank you for listening to the end. Take care. Goodbye.